Hey guys, welcome back to the Golf Podcast. This is episode number 404. And in a few minutes, we're going to bring our guests on who are Gary Nickel and Carl Morris. So Mike, they are the authors of the Lost Art uh, series. Mm -hmm. uh, we, they did the Lost Art of Golf, the Lost Art of Putting, and most recently, the Lost Art of the Short Game, which is a book that I'm about a quarter of the way through. I've been digging into it, and this is something that, Mike, I, I could definitely yeah, use. You've been so. soul-searching in the short game. I right have now. been soul-searching. <laughs> so I have been. I was really excited when this one came my way. Mm -hmm. uh, and these guys, like I said, they've made uh, uh, waves with their Lost Art of Golf series. They're best-selling authors. Uh, and and I just, I've heard them on other podcasts. Yeah, I know same. they're just mm -hmm. great guys, very knowledgeable working from both the mental game side of it as well as you know the actual you know from a physical coaching and fundamental standpoint so they two work hand in hand really well together so i'm really excited for that plus there's some great stories in here including some stories about uh, I would say what would be probably one of the most entertaining golfers ever and most ta naturally talented golfers ever, Seve Ballesteros. Mm -hmm. uh, he talked about how he learned the game with just one club. You know, he had a three iron and he had to learn to play different things. So there's a little bit of, of creativity in the game that that could perhaps is lost. And yep. maybe that's the lost art there that we'll go. talk about. Maybe that's it. Yeah. So Seve I'm excited for three that. Three irons out of the bunker? Out of the bunker. I think, it, if nothing else, that's a challenge that you and I may have to we just gotta try. We got to try that. We yep. may have to try that one out. Um, also, want to talk really quickly, guys. If you haven't already joined our uh, Clubhouse community on Leveler, give that a look. Go to golfacy.com slash clubhouse. We've got an excellent growing community there. And a lot of the suggestions that we have here for the podcast are coming directly from there. I know, Mike, you like to use the group to get some feedback from people. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, just taking a look. There's a lot of great conversations that are going on, um, especially right now. Everyone's kind of going into hibernation but they're talking equipment now yes. so you got guys in there talking about hey i'm looking to get a new driver and super helpful stuff yeah really we've cool. got equipment chat we talk about the podcast we're talking about all the different things it's, it's great because it's it's a private community where you can kind of just get in there uh, a really gr great group of people and just ask away talk about any of the golf topics you want to talk about uh some like in this even some of the favorite books that you've read so we've been really enjoying that uh really a fun place and we're going to have some some giveaways and things like that in there as well so go to golfisy.com slash clubhouse to join that we'll put the links in the video description too if you're watching this on youtube uh, in the meantime, let's do a quick word from our sponsor, and then I want to get right into this interview. I want to bring uh, Gary and Carl on the show because, like I said, lots to talk about I mean, in the short game. Yeah, and I love they, the way they break it down. So They do, and mm -hmm. they use an endless supply of things that we can learn from the short game, and that's, right. that's where the money's made. That's right. right? That's so right. we're going to chat about that in a second, but first, let's do a quick word from our sponsor. All right, big thanks to Titleist. The evolution of the T-Series advances Titleist even further in their mission to produce the best irons in the world. New materials, new processes, and new refinements, uh, new precision that must be felt to be, believed, to be believed, must be tried to be believed, must be fitted to be believed. I'm telling you, we just went through it uh, this summer. We went through the full T-Series iron lineup. We've been playing them now a few months, loving it, and just loving the different lineup all the way down. And you guys, like I said, you got to test it for yourself. Each model is an instrument of exacting performance passed from the Titleist R&D uh, to Tour Pros to guys like us. So, you know, check it out. The Titleist T-Series, precision made, precision pl played. Go check them out at Titleist.com. No doubt. And I also want to thank FootJoy. FootJoy sets the standard for shoe performance and style in 2021. And with the all new per Premier Spears, are inspired by golf shoes of the past, but supercharged for today's game. And they're designed in collaboration with some of the world's best players, Justin Thomas, uh, Adam Scott, Max Homa. You've probably seen these guys wearing them on tour. Uh, we've also been wearing them a lot in our videos which i'll tell you about more in a second but the premiere series it features classic styling with premium waterproof leathers great details that exclude exude craftsmanship that is complemented by that state of the art comfort and performance uh, features like that versa tracks plus outsole uh, and you can learn more by going to footjoy.com slash uh, I'm sorry, you can check out the premiere series by going to footjoy.com. You won't miss it if you go there. Uh, but like I said, it's been one of my absolute favorite shoes. I've been wearing them specifically, Mike, on days when we play more than one round. Yeah. That speaks volumes about the comfort. 36 holes, love it. And just, I feel like I've getting every bit of performance and traction out of these They things. always get a lot of oohs and ahs too. They do. Ooh, where'd you get yeah, those? Where'd you those get are the, classy. Especially yeah. with the different color combos yeah, that are right, out there. Right, There's a right. lot of different ways you can mm -hmm. mix and match it. So really enjoying those and you guys will too. So make sure you give those a look. 
And lastly, want to thank Shot Scope. Uh, I know we're just this is just coming out as this uh, this episode's coming out just after the big Black Friday Cyber Monday rush. We saw some incredible deals, uh, and some of these deals that they've got going through the holiday season. Not only if you know if you you were waiting to pull the trigger on Shot Scope, now's the time. But if you're looking for that perfect gift for uh, the golfer in your life. Check out ShotScope because all of their products, tried and true, tested, incredible products. We use them all the time. And what I love about them, no subscription fees. So mm-hmm. whether it's the the V3 watch that gives you GPS distances while you're out on the golf course while tracking all of your statistics, or the G3 watch, which is that same state-of-the-art GPS without the stat tracking, or the Pro L1 laser rangefinder, which features that vibration pin uh, lock, knowing that you've you've shot your number. It's got slope adjustments, got all those things, all the features that you're looking for at prices that are just incredible. Well, one thing I'll say, and we've said it here on the podcast before, they do sell out quickly. We saw the V3 sell out before. So whether it be for yourself this holiday season or for that golfer in your life that you're buying gifts for, make sure you hop in, check it out now. Go to shotscope.com slash golficity. You can also use our coupon code golficity to make sure you're getting the best price. Uh, but these are incredible. We love them. We use Shotsco products every round, and I'm sure you guys will enjoy them too. All right, let's jump right into our interview now with Gary Nickel and Carl Morris, authors of the best-selling Lost Art of Golf series. All right, so like I said earlier, we're super excited to have Gary Nickel and Carl Morris on the show, authors of the best-selling Lost Art of Golf series, but most recently, The Lost Art of the Short Game, which, Mike, we joked before, that you and I certainly can use a little bit of help here. Absolutely. So super excited for the conversation. So Gary and Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having us. We're uh, we're looking forward to it. Absolutely. So let me start with this question first. And and one thing that obviously the, the title hints at is the, the lost art, you know, it kind of hints that if it's lost, it was once found. So, uh, I want to talk about that and get your, your take on this. Is this something, uh, whether it be with the short game or some of the other areas of the game, is there something we've gotten away from in modern golf that we're aiming to get back to when you say lost, what's your take there? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, in, in the age that we're in now, there is so much information available and we've gone down a very scientific route over the past 10 or 15 years, which is great. You know, science, science has its place. Um, but we believe it's been at, at the detriment of some of the artistry of the game. We actually start the book by talking about two of the greatest shots that has ever been played in, in the history of golf, two, two short game shots. One was Seve Ballesteros on the 18th at Royal Birkdale in 1976 when he was 19 years of age and announced himself to the world stage. And then one that everybody will be familiar with is, is Tiger's famous pitch on 16 in 2005 mm-hmm. when he played that unbelievable shot when the when the Nike logo appeared and just fell into the hole and the, and the commentator said, in your life. And um, it was it, that's an incredible shot. But what we talk about is... If you look closely at those videos, there's tremendous amount of imagination being employed and creativity. And sometimes what happens if we go too far on the scientific route, it can be at the expense of imagination and it can be expensive creativity. So we're not saying ignore the science. We're not saying right. don't utilize it. But to create a bit of a balancing act is the book that we've put together, and Gary and myself, is full of suggestions about becoming maybe a little bit more childlike, you know, not childish. There's plenty of childish golfers out there, but more <laughs> more childlike in the sense of, in the in the, in the sense of just creating, um, just engaging your imagination to to see what's possible in terms of creativity. Yeah, and I think when you that's a it's a good path to start with because when you think about those two examples, both guys, Seve and Tiger. And you, what we know of of them learning the game at a young age was a lot of creativity and experimentation. You know, I think of of the stories of of Tiger, where his father, you know, he would only have have well one club to hit multiple shots, or even more specifically. And you talk about it in the book, Seve learning the game with just a three iron, and he had to learn. I believe it was a three iron, uh, but had to learn. It was great, to, yeah get very creative uh imagine hitting a three iron out of a bunker so a lot of us you know we we approach the game in all different 
stages of life. Some of us are fortunate enough to be at a young age. Some of us, you know, when we're, we're older, we pick up the game. Um, but is it that, do we have too many tools at our disposal? You know, and, and I think about a lot of the, um, the, the listeners of the show who, who have kids that they're starting to show the game to. Is that where maybe some of the creativity can come in? Is, is, is maybe just limiting some of their tools a little bit? In that manner, what's your thought absolutely. there? Absolutely, hop in and let me know what you think. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I certainly my my first set of golf clubs were actually a half set, sand wedge. I had a, I think I had a two and a half wood and a putter. So I, I, mean, I was pretty lucky. I had a good. I, uh, sorry, uh, I think we just just uh, lost Gary. Carl, you still with us? Yeah, I am. Yeah, and just just yeah, just a pick pick on that i i actually had a full set started so i can't uh, i can't engage the same story that gary was doing about a half set but reverting back to seve not only did seve learn to play golf with just a three iron he learned to play on a beach at right. pedrena and can, can can you imagine what was required to play pitch shots with the three iron on a on a on a on a sandy sandy beach i remember many years ago seeing him give a clinic uh, to a bunch of golf professionals at, I think it was at Wentworth in the UK, and he was playing these beautiful soft lob shots out of a bunker with a three iron. Just wow. unbelievable. And he, and, he, and he threw the gauntlet down to a bunch of other pros to try and have a go at it, and they got in there, and they're all drilling the ball into, into the in face of the bunker and, you know, thin it and duff it and the rest of it. But he, he said that, you know, when he actually got a full set of golf clubs, it was like cheating because he'd learned to create, he'd learned what he needed to do with opening the club face and he'd learned how to cut underneath the ball. So obviously when you get a sandwich in your hand after being able to do it with a three iron, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Yeah. And, and we've got Gary back now and, and, and guys, excuse Sorry about any, that. no worries. Excuse any disconnection issues that you guys are across the pond here. So that happens. So, uh, Gary too, uh, it will let you pick back up where you left off. I, you think you were saying that you had a half set, uh, yeah, a, I was one of the lucky ones. I had a half set. You know, most of some of the other kids that we we all started playing golf with, was, you know, everyone has a seven iron or a five iron or something or, or an old cut down, hand me down from a, a father or an uncle or a next door neighbor or something, and you just learned how to play so many different shots. Hmm. We we didn't. We had no idea. We were learning how to be creative and how to be imaginative. We just, you know, if if the target was far away you put it back in your stance and it hit lower and harder if the target was closer you'd open the face up and move the ball forward in your stance and pop try and pop it up in the air a bit now we didn't always get it right that's for sure but right. you soon learned that there are multiple ways to play pretty much every single shot i think the the problem with a lot of modern technology and modern golf coaching or instruction or teaching whatever you want to call it is it's become a bit too one-dimensional hmm. And the technology in golf, golf equipment, golf balls, golf clubs, they've kind of pushed us a little bit down that route as well. You know, we've got a, a, every club must go a certain distance. You know, people go for distance mapping sessions. Nothing against that at all. But if you ask any real good player, any really creative player, how far do you hit a seven iron? They'll say, well, it depends. Right. I can hit it. I, I can hit it so high so far. Or I can hit it thirty yards further, or thirty yards shorter. You know, it's it depends on the situation. But I think it's it's so easy in today's world to get. You know, you've got to get a perfect number. You've got to get a perfect number. Well, you guys have played Scotland, played golf in Scotland, sorry. And while I'm sure you had some beautiful, typically beautiful Scottish sunshine, there were times where the wind was blowing, the rain was coming in at you sideways, and you have to create a whole bunch of different shots. Mm -hmm. So, in a, and what I'm hearing is in a lot of ways, we've become too one dimensional. I mean, in a way, like it's great. The advancements in, in, in equipment have made certain parts of the game, quote unquote, easier. However, sure. golf is an always changing environmentally, uh, you know, with, with weather or the courses, course conditions. I mean, even here in the States, just when we recently traveled and played Pinehurst and just the difference in the way wow. that the, the grass and everything was there, and, and all of a sudden our sure. wood shots. Remember that, Mike? We were like, we were we were, were lost like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> right. We were lost just trying to hit a fifty-yard pitch shot that we we would hit nor naturally here. So, I guess what I'm wondering is is how do we get some of that 
creativity back? Is it a matter of trying and learning new shots? Is it a matter of, of looking at the shots differently, approaching the shots differently, rather than kind of mentally going to the same patterns? What's kind of our, our best approach there? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one on. We in, in the in the first book we did the lost art of putting. We asked the question: Does the the stroke create the putt, or does the putt create the stroke? And most people's their initial answer. I mean, you know, in the second book we asked: Does the the swing create the shot, or does the shot create the swing? Mm -hmm. And again, it's all about we believe that the task creates the technique, rather than the other way around. We, we learn technique, but we don't necessarily learn how to play shots. Right. Now, anyone who's ever played the game, as you've just described, knows that it is an ever-changing environment. Mm -hmm. No two shots are ever the same. They're played at, you know, different... We've got flat lines, we've got sloping lines, we've got the ball above our feet, we've got the ball below our feet, we've got shots downwind, we've got crosswinds, we've got into the wind. It's all sorts of different things. And I think we've been kind of led down a path where all too often we're, we're golf coaching or instructions all about if you make a good swing, you'll hit a good shot. Now, we've all played with the guys who've got pretty golf swings and guys and girls who've got pretty golf swings who perhaps aren't the best players. Mm -hmm. But then you come up against someone who's got, oh, wow, that swing, really? Yeah. But they create some just spectacular golf shots. Yeah, we've so, all been beat by know, that guy yeah, at some point. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you, you think it's just life's not fair. Right. <laughs> but it right. happens, right? Because, you know, for us, that guy who with that swing... He knows how to play golf. Hmm. And you know, I, I he, like it's all about what you want to do with a golf ball, not with your golf swing. Yes. And and something that I remember from that book you're talking about is that we're so focused on the swing and not the shot. And and yes. now we see it more as we get a little bit more visibility at the best players at the tour level. And we're starting to see uh broadcast coverage where in between, you know, the lines type of mic'd up and we're we're hearing them talk and they're talking about the shot not the yes. swing that they want to do. So I think, yes. am I down the right path of you're saying like that's kind of the thinking shift that we're looking for? Absolutely. The shot's got to come first. Hmm. The shot creates the swing. The task creates the technique. Gotcha. Without question. And I, th I think we've just got it the wrong way around for too long. And I think the, if the you think industry it, has got it around the wrong way for too long. If, if you think about it, Frank, many, many golf lessons – just start with this scenario where somebody goes for a golf lesson and the pro says, okay, buddy, just hit a few shots. Let me see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the guy will hit some shots, left, right, up or down, whatever comes out. And then immediately the emphasis is on there is something wrong with your technique. Right. And, we, and we jump in and we, we then have an opinion about a golf swing. But to us, the question everybody should ask at the beginning of a golf lesson for somebody who's been playing, you know, even, even relatively early stage golfers, the question should always be, what type of shot are you trying to play? Mm. And once you ask that question, whatever, whatever, if somebody wants to play a draw, fantastic. Now, now, the, now the coach and player can collaborate to produce that shot. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great line, I think it was in one of, one of Stephen Covey's books, you know, the, um, the guy who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People many, many years ago, one of, one of his seven habits is begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to, that's a great way of looking at anything in life, you know, whether it's fitness or a business or whatever it is, begin with the end mind. What does the end product look like? Well, you know, we don't need to be Einstein to work out what's the, what, what is the end of a, of, a, of a golf motion. It's a golf shot. Mm -hmm. But we don't often begin with the end in mind. We jump it. We jump in at the analysis of the motion. And the motion can only be relative to the, or should only be relative to the shot. But it's amazing, Frank, once you get people changing their emphasis to what's wrong with my shots, as opposed to what's wrong with my swing, then we move away from opinions and we start to deal with facts. Hmm. That's interesting stuff. Well, I wanna harp on that a little bit more, but I wanna bring it back to the book for a second. The Lost Art of the Short Game. Um, we've had the great fortune of working with Bob Vokey. He's been on the show a couple of times. I'd love for you guys to tell us, tell our listeners, what has been his involvement in not only this book, but in your guys' life and career? Yeah, I'll take up on this one. I met Bob many years ago at an Open Championship when I was working with a couple of guys who were playing. I honestly can't remember the year or the venue, but it was probably early to mid 2000s 
and it was obviously somewhere in the UK, it was an open venue. And one of the guys I was working with uh, asked me to go and find Voki to because he, he wanted to make sure he had the right wedges for for that week because the ground was, believe it or not, we'd had a pretty dry summer, so the, the ground was quite firm. Right. And it was burnt dry and quite hard. And, you know, the, it, it just didn't feel that he had the right tools that he, in his hands. So I went away. I didn't know Bob. I went across. I find him and I yeah, asked him to come over. And he said, yeah, I'll be over in two minutes. True to his word, two minutes later, he, he arrived. And then he, I just, you know, listened to what he had to say. And it was just so simple talking about the the soul, the grind, the bounce. Bounce isn't a word we really like because it tends to give people the impression that the club is going to bounce and hit the, the ball right in the teeth, mm-hmm. which is never a great <laughs> great visual when you're standing over a pitch shot over a bunker. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we both people <laughs> had that thought flashing through our minds, haven't we? So, and, and he was just so helpful. And I just learned so much about just everything he said. And it just all made so much sense. You know, I, I've worked with various players and coaches over the years and I learned a lot from Bob, and I learned a little bit from other, you know, golf club designers, including um, Roger Cleveland. But Bob, for me, he was just <clears throat> obviously his wedges are perhaps the the most popular and well known around the world, and he's known as the the godfather of wedge design. Right. So when we were putting this book together, um, a very good friend of ours, an Irish guy who Carl and I both work with, called Barry Hobson, who's a real good friend of Bob's. We asked him if he could perhaps, you know, introduce us again. And he said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch and see what he says. So we exchanged two or three emails and we had a couple of chats. And then we had a, a, a really quite a lengthy Zoom call one night. And, you know, between the three of us, I would say Bob, Carl and I, none of us would get a job in IT. So by the time we, <laughs> by the time we actually got everything working. Um, but what the conversation we had was fantastic. Yeah, and you know it's we Carl and I have joked and talked about this often enough. You know, Bob's I think he's eighty two this year, just turned eighty two. Mm-hmm. Um, but he could pass for a man twenty twenty five years younger. Right, his enthusiasm for the game is that of a twenty two year old, not an eighty two year old. Mm-hmm. So he's, in, he's got such infectious enthusiasm and great knowledge and great stories and. It's just great fun to be around. And when he agreed to, when we asked him to, to write the foreword, he said, I'm not very good at writing, but I'll have a go at it. And he, he's done a great job for us. He's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. We always have a great story. We laugh on the first time he was on the show, uh, a fire broke out in the building and we were two minutes into okay. the conversation and Bob was energetic. <laughs> he was so into it. He was going, we were loving it. Someone came in and said, Bob, we got to evacuate the building. He said, I'll call you when I get home. He said, he's not going to call. He's a busy guy. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, Bob Vokey called yeah. back and it was a great well, interview. So yeah, he is a terrific mm-hmm. guy. Yep. And- and I'll tell you what, talking about that and getting to that side, the equipment side, uh, I, I think what you do really well in this book and as far as as far as I've dove into it so far of balancing between uh, understanding the equipment, understanding the technical side and understanding the mental side. And on that equipment side, one thing that really kind of um, from the wedge standpoint that kind of was really some, some lights were going off for me when you talk about this concept of surfing the turf. And more specifically yeah. about that using the um, the back edge of the mm. of the club because you know you talked about earlier like the, our fear of, of of you know blading one and catching it right in the teeth we all worry yeah. about that leading edge um, but I think just a little bit of understanding better of what that bounce really does and what it's like for guys like ourselves we we've learned to put ourselves in the hands of a good fitter. And they understand, and and they're finding appropriate bounds for us. But I think having the player themselves, I think that's where that some of that confidence comes from, is understanding a little bit about how that bounce worked. But I love this idea, and sure. I'd love to have you just expand on it a little bit about how thinking about that the back edge and just having it surf the turf a little bit. Yeah, I, I think one of the one of the ago. key. Th- Sorry, hmm. carry on, Carl. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just kick it off, Gary, and you can uh, you, you can finish <laughs> finish it off. Perfect. I um, I think one of the one of the key things, if you look at it, Frank, is that human human beings are 
Uh, Gary, if you could pick up there, because I think we just lost Carl again, some just technical issues. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we we're just talking about use of using that, that bounce better yes. and understanding that, that back edge rather than always the leading edge. Yeah. I think we, our biggest fear is not contacting the ball properly, yep. not striking the ball properly. But I, I've come to learn that over the years that I think contact between club and ball is secondary after the interaction between club and Hello. turf or club and sand. Yep. Oh, so we got, how we get we got the club car. to interact Perfect. with that is more important than actually how we, we interact with the ball. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, and that's where a lot of us end up going wrong. So, so Carl, um, we just, uh, Gary was just filling us in a little bit while we, we lost you for a second there. But if you want to pick up where you left off, we're talking about uh, using that bounce a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, Frank. Yeah, I, what I was about to say, what I, what I was about to say was that as as human beings, we're pretty good at using tools, in the sense that you know, you give somebody a screwdriver, they're not going to try and knock a nail with it. You know, if you give somebody a toothbrush, they're pretty good at brushing the teeth, because we understand what the tool is designed to be used for, mm -hmm. and that's where I think so many people go wrong with golf, is that they don't have a clear understanding of how to actually use the tool in the hand. As we said before, there's so much emphasis on what you're trying to do with your body and hinge your wrists and move your, move your, uh, your hips and all the rest of it. But actually, what are you trying to do with the tool in your hand? And when you understand that the back edge of the club basically gets you out of trouble and the front edge of the trub, front, front edge of the tr club gets you into trouble right. that the back what what we're, what we're trying to what we're trying to do very simply is just to get the back edge of the club to interact with the ground you know and even with beginning golfers if you say to a beginning golfer and you point at that back edge and you say to them right can you brush the grass with that back edge Virtually everybody, even a rank beginner, would be able to do that. They would, mm -hmm. they would understand, they would move the body and be able to brush the grass really quickly. And then you say to them, okay, well, let's put a tee there. Can you use the back edge to brush the grass and collect the tee? And all of a sudden they're collecting the tee. And this is, like I said, this would be a beginning golfer. But mm -hmm. even, even better players, one of, the, one of the best things that you can ever do is we use, a, we use um, an image in the book, a metaphor, is that if you imagine that the back edge of the club is like the wheels of a plane mm. and your only goal really is to get the wheels of the plane to land on the runway smoothly. Now, there are three possible landings. There's a smooth landing, there's a nose dive, and then there's an aborted landing. And, and pretty much that covers, the only, that, those are the only three things that you can do with a short shot. You can either dig the club into the turf too early, you mm -hmm. can either pull it up too quickly and thin it, or you can get the, the wheels to touch the tarmac smoothly. And a fantastic exercise for everybody listening at home is just to simply go to the range and go into kind of awareness mode. Don't, don't, don't do anything other than hit 10 shots and just ask yourself on each shot, which landing did I get? Was it a crash landing? Did the, did the front edge go in first? Was it an aborted landing or was it a smooth landing? And I promise you, very, very quickly, your system will organize and you'll start to just get those wheels touching down smoothly time and time again. Now, if you can interact with the, if you can interact with the ground on a consistent basis, you mm -hmm. have the foundation for a great short game. Yeah, and I think we've all know exactly what all three of those things feel like instantly. Yes. I mean, yeah. Instant feedback. We, we know when you've got that nice smooth landing, as you say. So I, I, that stood out for me in the book, and, and I, I thought that was something I definitely wanted to hit on here. Um, but the other thing, I know we're, we're touching a little bit on, on equipment. We're touching a little bit you know, uh, as far as balance and stuff like that. But just kind of going back into the mental game real quick. One thing I definitely want to get you guys' opinion on is – the kind of what we tell ourselves ab about our game, because I notice mm -hmm. me as, as a, as a golfer, whether it be the short game right now, short game is an area where I struggle. Putting was an area where I struggled for a long time and it goes on and off. I feel like it's almost this like self-fulfilling prophecy a little bit uh, for me that I will at times tell myself that I'm terrible at chipping. Whereas other times I feel like I'm terrific at it. And it's just this ebb and flow where uh, it, it doesn't take much for me to lose confidence. It could be one or two bad chips. And then all of a sudden I'm starting to tell myself I'm a bad chipper again. Mm -hmm. But 
getting that confidence takes a lot of time. I feel like it takes quite a few shots where all of a sudden I start to realize, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. And then the self-fulfilling prophecy is, whether it be putting or short game chipping, whatever it may be, as I start to uh, make better shots, they start to compound and I make better and better shots. <laughs> that makes sense. Sure. It seems like it, it's just always a slide that's going in one direction or the other. So how much of that is, is it that we go through physical slumps are they mental slumps? Is it is it what we're telling ourselves? What is it that I can maybe even change my thought patterns so that that I can kind of have a little bit more control over this rather than feeling I, I've, I'm always riding the wave, if you so to speak, good or bad? Yeah, I think the most important thing to to understand with that Frank is the idea that we're all basically just a collection of stories. Every person that you meet is just a bunch of stories, the stories that we tell ourselves about our capabilities, about uh, what we can achieve, the things that we do. And the thing is with a good story, if it, if it becomes compelling, you start to believe it after a while. Now, the way that we tell our stories with the short game, you just said there, and it gave everything away. You said, you know, I, if I hit some good shots, I feel good. If I hit some bad shots, I start to feel bad and the downward spiral starts. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, what, about, what about if we eliminated the concept of good and bad shots? And we changed it that all you can ever do with the short game is get one of three landings. You can either get the crash landing, you can get the aborted landing, or you can get the smooth landing. Now, all of a sudden, you see, if you, if you say to yourself, I'm hitting bad shots, your brain has got nowhere to go with that. It just mm -hmm. becomes a label that then becomes a powerful story and a narrative that you begin to believe. But if you can say to yourself, actually, you know, I'm getting a few aborted landings, which you're thinning the, the, the ball across the green, all of a sudden then, You've got somewhere to go with that. Well, if I'm if I'm if I'm getting aborted landings, it means that the back edge isn't surfing the turf, and mm -hmm. you can start to go some with that. We've had unbelievable success with players when we say to them, "Never again grade a shot around the greens in terms of good or bad." That's just a one-way street to nowhere. Whereas if you've got three options of the three landings, then every single shot is a feedback mechanism that allows you to develop just in, in, in ways that can absolutely transform your game. So it's a little bit more of thinking of it as what what's the problem here and what's the solution rather than yeah. more of a, a personal exactly. attack that I'm inflicting on myself of saying that this is reflective yeah. of me as a golfer. Instead, I'm thinking, well, here's here's what went wrong and and here's how to solve it. Is that that about right? It's it's a hundred percent right. Is the shot you're faced with is it an obstacle that you're kind of putting in your own way there, or is it an opportunity to create something special? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's, so a, that's a fundamental it, but important shift right there. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah, but it, it's such a simple shift, but it's such an important one. You know how you perceive a shot will pretty much determine how you approach it. Yeah, and we, so we if see you that... tell yourself it's the hardest shot you've ever faced, then you could have put with a bit of trepidation, a bit of fear, aren't you? Yeah, that, then you've lost before you've even swung the club. And I think Correct. that's something we see often from like the best golfers are the ones who who are they're really largely unaffected by what just happened or what pattern seems to be happening. They they just they kind of go into this mode. And I, I mean, you guys have worked with lots of golfers. I'm not sure if you have any insight into what that mode is, but they go into this kind of mode where it's just like the next shot just becomes the next shot. And it's just kind of a problem to solve or the, what do they want to do? Going back to what we started talking about earlier, where they're thinking about not the swing, but what shot do I want to accomplish here? So, I mean, any, exactly. any, any of that, I guess that can rub off on us, uh, you know, everyday golfers, I think, is something that can be a, a massive. I'm going to say thought. one word, and I'm going to let Carl take over. Acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you might say that word, Gary, <laughs> 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 and then and throw throw the ball to me, and I've got to score the try. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, Frank? We we've we've often said over the past few years, if there was one single mental game skill that we wish we could gift to everybody because it would make the biggest difference. It would be the concept of acceptance. Mm -hmm. The idea that you get really involved in the shot, you create clear intention what you're trying to do, but you actually accept the outcome, good, bad, or indifferent. And by actually accepting the outcome, what you're doing is you're embracing the facts of the game. You know, the fact of golf is it's chaotic. 
the fact of golf is you can never be consistent because nobody in the history of the game has ever been consistent. Mm -hmm. And yet that's a word that everybody throws around. I want to be consistent. Well, <laughs> you know, Mo Norman got close and Ben Hogan got close. But I think, you know, Mr. Hogan said he, when he played his best golf, he only hit three shots around that turned out exactly as he, as he wanted to. So even, even the, the so-called machines of the game are not consistent. Why on earth do we think you know, and you play once a fortnight, that you can be consistent. Right. But it's because we're fed, we're fed this narrative constantly, you know, the secret to consistent golf, the secret to a consistent swing. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, folks, if the secret's out there, I'd like to hear it because I've been searching <laughs> for it for 45 years and I've got no nearer <laughs> to it now than I've ever done. But yeah. what, what, I, what, I have come, what I have come to realize is that when you embrace the chaos, when you embrace the inconsistency, and you accept all outcomes, acceptance creates the opportunity to let go of what's just happened in, in a past that will never return and allow you to create a future that's not happened yet. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking about the ways that we build these expectations. Like we watch, uh, you know, golf on, on Sundays and what does a broadcast do is they, they constantly cut to all the action. You know, so you're yeah. watching four hours of the best possible golf shots that can happen. And we don't see Well, you're guys. watching the best players playing their best. Exactly. You only see the leaders of the weekend, don't you? Exactly. And we're, we're not seeing the guys who are not playing well. And even the no. best players have those days where they're not playing well. And it takes going to your phone and looking up the scoreboard to see uh, your favorite golfer has missed the cut and he's had a terrible sure. day. But we don't know. That. And, and we get this expectation that, okay, we, we need to – you know, that's how good golf is played. And, and these guys have eliminated bad golf from their game because we don't get to see it. And it's not mm. until you've actually gotten out there and you've, whether you attend an event or you play with a terrific golfer that you see that, you know, they struggle too. And I think that sure. that's what makes it a little bit easier to, to, to digest, but you're right. Accepting it because I think that that for me is what leads me down that road of saying I had a bad shot. Oh, I'm bad. I have a bad, my shot. world's ending. Right, right. My mm -hmm. short game is terrible. Mm -hmm. And now, as you said earlier, the la like the the you know the kiss of death for a short game shot is stepping up to it, thinking I'm terrible at my short game. <laughs> That's the kiss of yeah. death. Yeah. Well, we we talk a lot about the thinker and the prover. What the thinker thinks, the prover proves. And I think sometimes you'd rather be right than good. See, I told you I was going to duff it in the bunker there. I told you I was going to, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so when you keep telling yourself you're not very good at something, your your brain and body will go in search of evidence to actually back that up to support that. Right, and that's a bit of kind of the visualization we hear people talk about, right? So absolutely, but it, but it all goes back to to your story, the story you tell yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, who who do you speak to most in your life? Yourself, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Would you ever speak to anyone else the way you speak to yourself? Definitely not. I wouldn't have many friends. Yep. <laughs> or family. Correct. <laughs> right. Would you Would you accept me talking to you the way you speak to yourself? Uh, absolutely not. No. 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 But so, we speak to us. I mean, we've got to be a bit kinder to ourselves, haven't we? We are our hardest critics. That is for sure. We're always our always always going to be our own harshest critics. Yeah. And you know, when when you sit down in the club pines after your round of golf. You know, we often ask players to think about their, their three best shots they played on that day and write them down. Mm -hmm. But what do we do? We pick out all the bad ones. Right. We gloss over the good ones. You know, that, that drive you split the fairway with on the t off the 10th tee, great shot. Yeah, but that's what I was, that's what I was trying to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. Yep. What about the one on the next hole when I hit it out of bounds and I you know, lost the next one in the ditch before the green and oh, all sorts of things? We, we tend to only recall the, the bad ones. Yep. Which is not helpful because that's just reinforcing that negative story, that poor story, which you buy into because you know, you're telling yourself, so you're gonna believe it, right? Yeah. We as golfers are good at that. Yeah, we could be we could be one stroke away from our personal best and we don't think about all the strokes that got us there. We think about that one that could that we just didn't quite hit right and oh, yeah. could have been our personal best. I mean it's just yeah. we're we're good at that as golfers, that's for sure. Um, but you would even, never even the guy, anything even, else in life like that, would you? No, right. you just wouldn't. No, it's crazy. Even he, even the guy who shoots fifty nine thinks he should have shot fifty eight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> At worst, fifty eight. Uh -huh. We're an interesting bunch, golfers. But, that's for sure. Yeah. For sure. One one of the things on that point, though, that you could you know people could play around with, 
is is what we call the difference between statements and questions. Now, a lot of the things where we get in our own way uh, and get into the negative spirals are statements about ourselves. You know, I'm useless. I'm a I'm a klutz. I can't do this. My short game's terrible. All the stuff, yada yada. Um, those are statements. Now, some of those statements you you begin to believe after a period of time, and they just they just confirm the story. However, good questions can take you in a different direction. You know, one of the one of the most powerful questions I've ever heard for golfers. You know, it was it was Fred Shoemaker, the great coach from California, who, who such a simple thing to, to to do is you know when you, when you face with the next shot, be that a putt, a chip, or whatever, the question you can either make a statement. Or you can ask yourself a question. Now, for everybody listening to this to this session, the question is: Could the next shot? Is it possible that the next shot you play could be a good one? Now, every single golfer listening to this, if you answer that question honestly, the answer is yes. That it's, mm -hmm. it's possible. You may you may have had the worst round you've ever had in your life, but the next shot that you've got, it's possible it could be a good one. Well, why don't we why don't we stay open to possible? Because your first possible is on the first hole, and you only run out of possible when you tap it in on the 18th. Right. It's so true. And, and yeah, it's just, again, that shift that we think about the possibility of things going wrong more than right. But um, just yeah. just an incredible little shift. And, and um, we'll, we'll leave it there because we're running out of time. But what, one thing I will say is we're, we've only scratched the surface here, what we're talking about, of, of what you've got here in the book. Uh, and I truly truly enjoy books like this because I feel like it's accessible to every level of golfer because when we move a little bit away and we talked about how I, I do like how you guys dip into some of the equipment and the technique, but when we move a little bit away from that and we talk about things about how we can approach it better with our mind, like we're talking about here, that's something that everyone can do. So it doesn't matter whether you've just started with the game, doesn't matter what level you're at, you're going to get better just by changing your approach mentally. And I think you guys do a terrific job of that in the book. I'm looking forward to, to finishing it and coming on the other side, thinking a lot more positively yeah. <laughs> about my short game. That's for sure. Um, but guys, it, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, we'll link to uh, where everyone can get the book, obviously in the show notes. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to stop by and, and apologize to our listeners for a little bit of the disconnection issues, but that's what happens when you're trying to do a call overseas, I guess. But, uh, but yeah. guys, it's been an absolute pr pleasure. Thanks for Thank, the opportunity. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Despite the fact I dipped in and out there, I seem to have a bit of a dodgy connection at my end it's because of whatever reason. I don't know. But please let us know how you get on. Uh, we'd like to hear your, your stories about your new stories about how you're a fantastic short game exponent now That's it. in the future. So if you can let us know how you get on, then we'd, we'd love to come back and have another chat with you to hear your success stories. Absolutely. Uh, we will be changing that narrative for sure. Thanks ever so much, fellas. I really, really enjoyed it. And again, apologies from my side. Pod podcasts are a little bit like golf. You never know what's coming next. Exactly. So we, uh, we, <laughs> Great. we, we, <laughs> we dealt true. with it okay. It's true. But we've Thanks all walked off the 18th green smiling. So, hey. Right. It's exactly right. Well, guys, thank you again. <laughs> Best of luck with the new book. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you're a pro hey, now. Um, yes. All right. Beware in our next challenge. Okay. Mike, you heard uh, it here, guys. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it is so true. And like I said, I want to get into it with them because as I'm reading through the book, it's ringing more and more true to me. And then it's a tough pill to swallow sometimes to realize how you could be wrong. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. But I'm like, you know what? I, I like that's me. Like I'm that guy who's like, as soon as one or two things go wrong, I start to tell myself, you know, I'm not playing well. And I remember it was just. Not too long ago, we were talking on the show, we did some episodes on chipping and I and I put a little more focus into it and all of a sudden I was chipping the ball better and then I found that I was, as I was getting the ball closer to the hole and I could rely on my chipping more, yep. I could get more aggressive with my approach shots mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I'm like, things are clicking. But And, and guys, I, I know a lot of you out here can relate to that. It doesn't take much for that to go back out the window and all of a sudden we start telling ourselves again, oh, we're no good at this or mm -hmm. whatever. And it is, if you think about it, it truly is a recipe for disaster to step up to a shot with a narrative in your mind oh, that yeah. things are going to go wrong. Things are going to go wrong. Right. You don't want to approach anything 
like that. No, you don't. No. And, and I think about like when we're out there with you and, and, and you've become so good around the greens with your 60. So right. much so your 60 degree that you got stamped on at your money club. Right. But think right. about it. Not only, yes, I'm not taking away anything from the technical aspects of how you play the shot, but think about the story. They, you know, we're talking with, with Gary and Carl about the stories that we tell ourselves. The story we're constantly telling ourselves is like, hey, you're money with that club, man. Yeah, we're always saying it. That's right. his money club. That he's money Can with that club. Can you say that after I send over every club? Right. It's, it's a six iron. We'll he just, loves it. We'll just get money stamped on all his clubs. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. So I get what you're saying, because right? of that, it's mm. we're reinforcing that, and by telling yourself that, hey, I'm good with this club, and then what happens is the self fulfilling prophecy that most of the time you are shot. good, yeah. and then it becomes that much easier for us to shake off those few times we hit it bad. Be like, ah, fluke. You know, yeah. I'm normally great with this club, this club or this shot. That was a fluke. Versus the other way of thinking, be like, ah, that's me. Yeah, exactly. You know. Right. It's funny. You know, it'd be an interesting little case study to ask every golfer, just go through all 14 clubs and on a scale of one to 10, men, you know, give me your comfort level of each yeah. one. Right. You'll have some at 10, you'll have some at one. Exactly. You know, and then how much of and that? And then you go into the one that's one out of 10 saying, never saying anything positive about it in your head. Right. Never. You just get over there, just maybe in the back of your mind, hoping it's not going in the woods, right. hoping you don't chunk it. But then I'd be interested to see how it plays out if you apply some of the techniques that they talk about in the book exactly. to those clubs that you are less confident with and, and kind of reshifting your thinking, how that can become, uh, you know, where you can develop that club that was an issue for you can now be part of your arsenal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. really interesting stuff. Like I said, I, I mean, this is something that I always love diving into this, this mental game because it's something that we can all, no matter your physical ability, you can improve your mental game. That's just the reality by just putting a little bit of knowledge and focus into it. But I also like the fact that we dipped a little bit into the equipment. I'm definitely going to be thinking more of that surf the turf yeah, uh, idea like and those those landings. So mm -hmm. getting to know and understand the bounce on your clubs better allows you to use them. And also what we touched on of this idea of being more creative out there. Um, and I think it's so important because it can be a barrier to some people getting into golf as they think, I can't afford a, a set of clubs. Right. Right? right. But now we're thinking of it the other way of saying, maybe that's a benefit. Maybe get out there with three, four clubs and learn to play the game with that. And now life's going to be a lot easier for you when you've got 14. Yeah, I like so. that. I like the way they approach that. Very interesting mm -hmm. stuff. So guys, uh, like I said, we'll put all the show notes. You can go to golfacy.com uh, slash episode 404. You can get to the links. And guys, pick up a copy of the book. It's terrific. And if you like it, they have their other books, including the putting one, which I'll, I have a copy of. I'm going to be moving on to that next when I finish this one up because you got to be uh, got to be deadly around those greens if you want to score. Uh, but big thanks to both Gary and Carl for joining us on the show today. Uh, get to the show notes by going to golfacy.com slash episode 404. And we'll see everybody again next week.